and welcome to Legislative Report. Today, my guest is State Representative Mike Jones from the 93rd District in New York County. Representative, now we've had a few days go by since Governor Wolf has issued his budget address. What in general is your, are your thoughts on what you heard that day? Well, I think we um, heard some positive things. And I think in fairness, as you know, coming from a Republican, I mean, obviously, you know, he's a Democratic governor. We're Republicans, so we didn't expect it, uh, you know, that we'd be totally on the same page. Um, but um, I think compared to previous years, Scott, that uh, as a starting point, Overall, we were pretty happy with a lot of what we heard. It gives us something we can work with. Um, in particular, you know, his uh, his opening remark, really, uh, that there's no new taxes, which I was a good thing. Uh, we, it, was, it was kind of interesting because our side was standing and applauding, and the other side, I'm not sure, knew exactly what to do with that. <laughs> but in any event, I commend the governor for taking that position. Um, I do want to clarify, though, that he's talking about the general fund budget, which is he's proposing about a... $34 billion budget, um, that excludes a number of special funds. You know, we've got, I think that's something for people to understand. We've got, um, you know, federal monies of about um, just, just shy of $30 billion. And then you've got um, the lottery, you've got motor licensing, and you've got a host of other special funds that are fed by, you know, fees and various things. So it's really an aggregate about an 85, almost $86 billion total budget. And I share that because um, no sooner had the governor said that than that when we went back into session, the Democratic uh, chair of the Appropriations Committee was calling for a severance tax. <laughs> so when they say no new taxes, we're happy that, that we're happy about that. But that's sales and income tax. Um, they are asking for increased taxes on you know shale, shale uh, oil, and natural gas, and so forth, as well as some other things, some ambulatory care, and some things that we're not you know that we're not real keen on. But as a starting point, I think that was good. I was glad to hear about vocational education. Um, being a priority. And of course, you know, it was, it was good, uh, you know, bipartisan spirit, I think, that came through in the speech. So, we, you know, we were, we have a lot to commend him on there. Okay. I want to talk about some of his specific proposals. After I ask you, is there anything in the address that you didn't hear that you'd hope you would have heard about? Yeah, one, really one thing in particular, um, and that is property tax. And I think it is 100% clear what my number one mandate from the voters in York County. We've got a number of other th very important issues, don't, don't misunderstand me, uh, and we'll probably talk about some of that vocational education, and you know, we've got an opioid epidemic, a lot of things, but hands down, the most important issue for us in York County and in the 93rd District is property tax. And um, we've got to do something about it. That message has come through loud and clear, and I want voters to know that is my top priority. And uh, it would have been nice to hear something there. I've talked with the governor. You know, uh, uh, we've had some one-on-one uh, -on -one type conversations, and he he's open to doing something on property tax. Now we got to figure out what that something is and how we get it done. But other than that, that was that's the one that really jumped out because it's such a big priority for us. Okay. As we talk, they're currently in the midst of a House Appropriations Committee hearings where they're looking at the budget proposal and, 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 and evaluating some of the things. Uh, the one thing the governor mentioned, which really dominated one of the recent hearings, is his proposal to increase the minimum wage right up to $12 to start. No right. slide right to 12 What do you right. think about that? Well, um, first of all, unlike some of my Republican colleagues, and I understand the philosophical argument, don't misunderstand. I'm a free market capitalist, and we really don't need to increase the minimum wage. The markets take care of that. So to be clear, I believe that. With that said, almost all, the vast majority of employers, especially if you carved out uh, uh, maybe a special wage for uh, younger adults, you know, 18, 19 and younger, because we really just want to get them in the workforce. It's not so much about how much they're making, it's about getting that experience. You're at something like uh, one or two percent of workers, you know, above the age of 19 or even making minimum wage. So I don't have an issue, quite frankly, um, with doing a little horse trading is, is my thought. Uh, we'll take it to 10 bucks, maybe scale it up to 12 or 13 over a three or four year period. But in exchange for that, I'd like to see work requirements on able-bodied folks that are, that are receiving welfare benefits. They have no dependents. They're able-bodied. There's hundreds of thousands of you know, workers there that we're not tapping into, and it will help make them wealthier. Uh, I'd like to see some regulatory reform. So personally, I think minimum wage is something where we could do some negotiating if we get um, some things in exchange. Um, unfortunately, when you hear people calling for 12 and 15, some of that's a political play. They know darn well that uh, we're not gonna vote for that. They don't even necessarily want it themselves. They want the political issue. So I think something more responsible, 
you know, 10 bucks an hour, perhaps scale it up to a 12 or 13 over a three or four year period. That's something we could probably all live with. Um, unfortunately, I think it's being used a little bit more for the political play than actually making meaningful change. We as Republicans want to see more of the 60, 80, $100,000 <laughs> a year type jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that's what that's what our objective is, is that nobody's making minimum wage. So. Okay. Another wage issue, uh, he floated the idea of raising every teacher's minimum starting salary to $45,000. Besides the figure there, uh, average taxpayer, the first thing they think of is, where's the money going to come from? How does this affect my property taxes? I mean, there seem to be some logistical questions about how you actually do that, never mind what the figure is. Yeah, I, again, to me, just a political talking point. Uh, State government's got its hands in too many things to begin with, much less getting down into teacher uh, salary. Union, union <laughs> contracts. Yeah. Unique con that's why we have school boards. That's why we have local control. Uh, you know, in Dallas town, you and I were talking, I, I, you know, our starting salary is already well above that. And you know, we're on the high end. Um, but I, I think, I, you know, I, I'll caveat that I don't know everybody's starting salary. But in, in a place like York County, Lancaster, very few, if any, schools are already they're already above that to begin with. So it's really a rural issue. So for a number of my colleagues in rural areas, um, that's a real concern. And so my question is, why, why would I want to be dictating or the governor dictating to those school districts? Um, that's why you negotiate. That's why you let the markets. Um, they're going to they're gonna pay what they have to pay to get teachers. It takes care of itself. That's why you have contract negotiation. So this, the state ought to stay out of that. We got our hands full with Got our, got our hands in too many pies to begin with. A lot of so, other stuff, yeah. yeah good point. Uh, Governor Wolf talked about lowering the corporate and income tax. He's not the first one to do that, obviously. Now, you've been in the business world for a very long time. Yeah. Can you talk to the average person about why that's such a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. For one thing I do want to say, when, when you hear corporate, um, like, the, like I was president of a 120-person, $30 million company. However, we are what's called an S-corporation. I don't want to get in the weeds on that, nor am I qualified to get in the weeds. But understand that a lot of small and mid-sized businesses are what we call S-corporations. So we, that, the money actually goes to the individual uh, owners, and then they pay at the personal income tax rate, okay. which in Pennsylvania, one of the very few good things you can say about our tax code is that that 3% personal income rate is actually not bad compared to the rest of the country. So when you get you talk about the corporate net income tax, we have the opposite. We're at like 9.9%, I think the highest or second highest in the country. And this affects corporations, what we call C corporations, mm -hmm. uh, which are generally your bigger companies. Um, I spent 20 years in, in my career, not only in business, but helping large and very large companies figure out where they were going to locate distribution and manufacturing centers. I, will pers I, can, I can assure you that when they're doing what we call that site selection, they're looking at Pennsylvania versus Maryland and Delaware and New Jersey and you know, Ohio, these states we're competing with, they will, in, in some instances, they will quickly rule out Pennsylvania when they see that 9.9 percent corporate income tax. Um, it's not the only factor by far. Um, it is a huge deterrent to business. Um, it's costing us good jobs. <laughs> it, it, we appear business unfriendly. Costing us jobs. Uh, yeah, and a lot of times, just keep in mind, we, we may never even get to the negotiating table with some of those companies. They might eliminate us before they even come and sit down and talk about it. So um, I think the governor's right to want to reduce that. I think, you know, 6% or so over time. Uh, is about where we need to be competitive, uh, support that. He wants to do something called combined reporting. That's a whole other thing um, but in, uh, that he wants to tie into that, that we're, that we're generally opposed to. Um, but the idea of lowering the corporate net income tax is a great idea. We strongly support that. Yeah, he talked about that being kind of a not welcome sign, so to speak, for businesses, or not very welcome, right. let's put it that way. Um, is that the biggest deterrent in terms of why other why other jobs in other states don't come this way? Uh, it's probably in the top three. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, the other ones I would throw in, our regulatory environment is, is just crazy. Um, and so you will, for ex for simple example, and, and I, I talked about this a lot over the last year, year and a half, one of the big contractors in our area uh, will tell you that permitting, for example, in Virginia, even Maryland, believe it or not, might be, you know, a process that might be 60 or 90 days in some of those states can be at least a year, if not a year and a half or two years in Pennsylvania. Companies are like everybody else. They, they drag their feet. They don't have time for that kind of, uh, you know, so the regulatory environment, you know, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot in a big way there. There's a lot of things we could streamline. Uh, it's not just eliminating regulations, which is part of it, but it's also being more efficient at getting through the process. The other big one, 
is uh, workforce, which I'm, you know, we'll, we'll probably elaborate on a little bit here. Yeah. But um, when I was, you know, historically when you were doing these studies, transportation costs, the, the labor costs, the real estate costs were big drivers. In recent years, uh, for many, many companies, the biggest driver is workforce availability. And I can't emphasize that enough. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's yeah. like property tax and workforce are the two things. And in York, where we've got 20% manufacturing jobs, which is over double the state average, if we don't have the workers, we're gonna lose those jobs, we're gonna fail to attract new ones, and that's what sustains our quality of life. So that is just paramount that we keep that workforce uh, strong in, yeah. in the, 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 uh, the skilled and semi-skilled labor. And ironically, uh, your county has, and some people don't realize this, actually the oldest yeah. technical school in the country in what I still call York Botech, York County right. School of Technology, but right. we have a tremendous asset here that could probably even be used even further as far as success rates go. Yes, and, and I actually um, just met with the, uh, the director there, the superintendent, mm -hmm. his title's director, uh, Dr. Dave uh, Thomas, Tom. just, just an outstanding individual and the work he's done there in the last 10 years is, is, is great, uh, uh, including really getting their academics up. And, and one of the things we're battling there, uh, the, the people at York Tech are doing a great job. Uh, we talked about you know ways we can expand that capacity uh, for some of the, the outlying parts of the county, not so much our district, because they sit in our district. Uh, transportation is an issue. So you know, I was talking with him about you know brainstorming, can we maybe do some center of excellence at some of the other schools where it could be sort of overseen by, you know, uh, York Tech folks, but um, a lot of it is the uh, the stigma still that we got to break through with parents, you know. And I, I'm I'm all for college for a lot of kids, but we're sending way too many kids to college when what we need are machinists and welders and uh, and people in the medical field, for example, these vocational and trades. And uh, they're yeah they're doing a great I mean just a, a great job there, but we got to really continue to. Uh, to promote that and spread the message. Yeah, finally, one of the things we mentioned, you mentioned before we were sitting down and we talked about regulatory reform. Here's so much about federal governments set the tone with some of their own actions and this, the economic success has kind of rolled downhill, so to right, speak, to hit right. the states, but we hear that there, we could be even doing better if we didn't have some of these these regulations in place. Right, and I did a little back of the napkin here before we started. Um, I, I hope my math is at least directionally sound. You know, the governor talked in his speech about, yeah, I think it was 33,000 new jobs we've created here. And that, you know, that's, that's nice and it's, you know, it's a good number, but when you put it in perspective, uh, the, the, what we're really benefiting from is the national economy <laughs> that has been so strong the last couple of years. Um, and we, you know, we nationally, we created about two point, during that same time period, give or take, we created about two and a half million jobs. Well, if Pennsylvania was getting our proportion of that, we should have created 100,000 new jobs, give or take, not 33,000. So 33 is actually, you know, when you put it in perspective, it's actually not <laughs> that glowing a number. And I would attribute a lot of that um, to the, un the uh, unfriendly regulatory climate and, and that high corporate net income tax. Those, that's where you start to see uh, that stuff coming back to bite you. And, and the numbers reflect that, I think. Okay. If you have questions about this or any legislative issue, We'll show you Representative Jones' contact information in a few seconds. I'm Scott Little. Thank you for watching Legislative Report.